Welcome everybody. My name is Andrew Adamson. I'm a map researcher and the owner of Heritage Charts. I work mainly out of British archives, but I necessarily spend time cross-referencing source material with archives in the United States. This presentation is a revised and re-recorded version of a talk given recently to the Washington Map Society at their annual dinner on May the 19th, 2023. The sources for the cartographic material presented here are the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office, the Library of Congress, and the Clements Library, University of Michigan. The full written article, The Bar's Great Folly, may be found and read in full on the Heritage Charts website in the Research Locker section, along with a copy of this presentation. The original presentation was made in collaboration with Frank Lecamelli, Lieutenant, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Retired, currently with George Mason University, ROTC. Frank is an expert on all matters Revolutionary War, especially around New York between 1775 and 1783. Much of his comment on military detail has been included here. Thank you, Frank. Now, before we move on to examine the material and the story behind it, I would like to acknowledge these very important people. I would especially like to highlight the wonderful work of archive staff in the UK and the US, many of whom are often the source of more information and knowledge than may be found in a good book. I would also like to highlight some important information. The Library of Congress Geography and Map Division is abbreviated here to LOC, as also is the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office to UKHO. Both abbreviations prefix the original shelf number or ID of the plans such that they are referred to herein as UKHO L690 and LOC L690. With apologies to the Library of Congress Geography and Map Division, G3804.N4S31776 M4 is a bit of a mouthful to repeat 45 times in 45 minutes. While we're considering essential information relating to the documents presented here, we should take a moment to clarify some terms. By definition, a map is a depiction of a given area, usually at a smaller scale, as in it covers a larger area. Maps are generally expected to be accurate on a geographic and topographic basis, but they do not need to be drawn to scale. In fact, they may also be topological. Think of a subway or a tube map. Now, while this description of a map would fit the material presented here, as in they are roughly laid out and not to scale, they are historically referred to as plans. This is because each details the position of military units and other significant or specific topographic features relative to the success of the operation being described. A plan needs to be accurate as these are. In reality, the most accurate description of the material here would be to describe them as accounts of the plan of the British campaign to take New York. But, for simplicity, we're going to keep with the historic title, Plan. After all, when we consider de Barre's purpose in making these accounts of the campaign, he was not trying to produce yet another map of New York. He was trying to produce an accurate account of the plan of the British campaign in New York between July and December 1776. Finally, the description manuscript or manuscript plan would be equally, equally applicable in as much as the documents are either drawn by hand or, if engraved at least in part, they were never as such published. But, for simplicity's sake, we will again stay with the term plan to describe them. I should say that some elements of the story told here remain incomplete due to a lack of contemporary documentation, especially that relating to the correspondence and financial accounts associated with the plans in question here. 
Until such information comes to light, much of the background to these plans is necessarily dependent upon what may be interpreted, surmised and, of course, supported by substantively associated information. This work should be considered to be a start to a wider investigation into the process by which map makers such as J.F.W. Debar worked. Now, we cannot progress without a quick introduction to Joseph Frederick Wallet de Debar and his most famous work, that of producing the Atlantic Neptune. The Atlantic Neptune is a collective name for a series of charts of the coast of North America produced by Debar in volumes between 1777 and 1784. No two volumes necessarily contain the same charts and plans, rather they were compiled to order. Individual sheets of charts were also distributed by Debar some as early as 1774. Here we see some examples of individual sheets from the Atlantic Neptune. The aim of this presentation is to introduce two hitherto little-known plans of the British campaign to quell the revolution in New York in 1776, made by Joseph Frederick Wallet de Bar. The two plans at the centre of this story were created as part of de Bar's effort to ultimately produce one single statement plan of the campaign worthy of the king. As part of the story of this plan, I will also introduce other related drafts and plans made by Debar and others, which are inextricably linked to the story. Crucially, Debar's efforts to produce this plan lay bare the process by which he worked and expose his attempt to enter the competitive realm of political and military mapping, which in itself was a diversion from his normal sphere of operations in the production of charts for his famous Atlantic Neptune series which were fundamentally topographic and representational by nature. Here we see a model of different types of mapping laid out by Pedley and Edney. You can see on the right of this model military mapping listed under political mapping. In order to explain Debar's intentions, resulting successes, failures and the consequences in making these plans, we will look at the following. First of all, we have, of course, the plans themselves. We have some details about the plans, how they're made, uh, military detail and some possible sources of Debar's information, the missing references to the letters on the plans, reasons for Debar's change from the type of representational and purely topographical mapping epitomised by the Atlantic Neptune to the realm of political and military mapping that the plans represent. We'll have a look at the cost of producing the plans, the great folly, why the project was doomed almost from the outset, and finally, Debar's recovery from the whole enterprise. So, my part in the story begins. A few years ago, when I had a much fuller head of hair, I encountered these two plans of New York in the UKHO. They got my attention because they were not just by J.F.W. Debar himself, but they were virtually undocumented. They are UKHO A9459 and UKHO L690. Please do note the poor condition of the L690, which is in a very fragile state, awaiting conservation, mainly for want of funds. So if anyone out there has a spare 10,000 guineas and would like to make a donation, please let me know and I'll pass it on. The original UKHO Book A entry for the plans had two copies listed, but only one could be found at the time of looking, much to the chagrin of the wonderful UKHO staff. It remained a mystery as to the whereabouts of the second copy for several years, until one day back in about 2016, when perusing the LOC website, I spotted it. 
It has subsequently been established that it was gifted to Rear Admiral Henry Arnold Caro of the former U.S. Coast and Geodactic Survey Corps, or NOAA, after a visit to the then UK Hydrographic Office in Crickerwood around 1956. It then passed on to the Library of Congress in the 1990s. Interestingly, the UKHO have no record of Caro's visit. There are in fact a few more plans involved, but these are the focus of our attention today. Here we see A9459. It is made up of a sheet of paper with a smaller sheet showing Lower Manhattan and part of Long Island being stuck onto the middle of it, by way of a starting point for the drafting of the surrounding environs. Note that the environs are drawn to a different scale to this centre panel. Newtown, for instance, is depicted as being bigger than Manhattan, and Manhattan had, what, 20,000 people in it at the time. A9459 literally forms the middle section of what would have been a large draft plan, based on certain assumptions, such that we could even find the missing pieces. Here we see the UKHO L690, which, as it melds across to show the LOC L690, we can see that at this scale, it is totally understandable that the two plans could be taken to be identical. But, as we shall soon see, they are not. And finally, here we have our fourth plan, which has a part to play in the story. This is Debar's 1777 plan of the operations of His Majesty's fleet and army under the command of Vice Admiral the Right Honourable Lord Viscount Howe and his brother General William Howe in 1776. This was made by Debar for inclusion in the Atlantic Neptune. The plans each measure 75 inches by 54 inches, which is certainly impressive. The side borders are drawn or painted on the edges of each of the sheets by hand. The top and bottom borders are stuck on separately. This allows for the possibility that Debar could extend the plan north or south as he wished, or indeed could afford to do so. American fortifications, British ships and topography are all engraved. Here we see the American defences at Brooklyn. And here we see the British ships Carisford, Phoenix, Phoenix sorry, Rose, Roebuck and Orpheus covering the landing at Kipps Bay on the 15th of September. At Fort Washington, we see American barricades and entrenchments engraved, but the troops have been added by hand on each plan. Some last minute defences at the fort were added by hand also. We may clearly see more of the engraving process when we look at the detail of Newtown and Flushing across the draft plan, A9459, and the two L690 plans. First of all, we can see that on the draft plan, Debar included the encampments of the 2nd, 3rd and 5th Brigades, along with an artillery park and even General Howe's headquarters. At Flushing, we also see the 71st Fraser Highlanders and a unit of light horse marked. When we look at the engraved UKHO L690, we see that none of that detail is included, but the spaces where they were are left blank, except for the artillery park, which has been included, presumably by mistake. This may be seen even more clearly when we look at the LOC L690. Finally, if we move across to the North or Hudson River, we can clearly see ink splodges on both the UKHO and the LOC L690s where blemishes in the copper plate have been filled with ink at the point of engraving or printing and have been repl replicated on both plans, 
a clear indication of engraving. Although the two L690s are pretty much identical, they are in fact two different editions. The LOC edition is clearly an update or upgrade on the UKHO edition. This may be seen when looking at the hand-drawn military detail included on the plans. Here we see the British at Brooklyn on the 27th of August, as depicted on the UKHO L690, the first edition of the engraved plans. Note the annotation lines which show the movement of the British units as they turn to face the retreating Americans as they fall back up the hill. It is much the same on the second edition, LOC L690. Although the depiction is much clearer with better colour, but no annotation lights. If we move back down the Bedford Jamaica Road, we see the vanguard of the British force on the morning of the 27th under Clinton. Firstly, on the draft plan A9459, where a lot of detail is included. And on the first UKHO edition of the L690s, we see slightly less detail, but annotation lines are still included. Finally, to the LOC or second edition, L690, where everything has once again been simplified. Note that the engraved road has been partially erased to accommodate the new depiction of the vanguard. No annotation lines and no artillery. We're now going to watch a short video which is going to take us through the military detail included on the plans. Please note that this is not an historical account of the action in and around New York between the 2nd of July and the 30th of November 1776. It is an examination of the detail of the action which Debar was able to bring to his plans. And for this, we will don glasses. So here we see UKHO L690 and LOC edition just here as well. Now we're going to go straight in on these plans and please for a moment excuse my scrolling and we're going to just have a quick look here at the military detail at Staten Island 2nd to the 12th of July we've got the transport ships which are all engraved uh, waiting to carry the British troops across to Long Island. Um, local New Yorkers described the arrival of nearly 400 British ships in New York Harbour at the time as watching a forest of masts arriving. Quite impressive, I'm sure. At the landing area, we have the landing craft covering the, uh, the landing, of course. We've got the transports, which are on the UKHO edition here. They are put on by hand, incidentally, here. And on the LOC edition, we can see the difference, although the transports were engraved. At Gravesend Bay, moving on to the encampments that we see here, the first piece of military detail on the UKHO edition, again, they're very simple. Um, they're not highlighted particularly. They're marked as a rectangle with a diagonal. On the LOC edition, the, um, the markings, they're rounded. Um, in that sense, it's a bit unusual, but typical of Dubai to do something a little bit unusual. Um, other encampments, which are marked here on the left, we've got Major General um, Grant's encampment after he landed from the 22nd onwards, where they stayed until the 26th. Um, on the 22nd, um, Cornwallis um, marched part of the British Army and uh, some Hessians, or the Hessians, under Colonel Donop and uh, de Heister. Uh, they're going to Flatbush. Here we see the Hessians marked in yellow at the end with some artillery and the British in front. As they come into Flatbush, where they set up camp until the 26th, they are spreading out, flanking, going into the village. And they were part of the, this was the second diversionary um, route planned by the British, the first being, of course, 
Grant on the left. On the 26th, if we come across here, this is the road from New Utrecht and going through Flatlands, and we find this is the tail end of the uh, main part of the British Army with Howe and Cornwallis, uh, etc. We've got at the back end of this, we've got caissons, and caissons were um, artillery tenders. I can actually, I think, show you a picture of a castle. There's one. Uh, all this type of baggage was, of course, crucial to the army as it moved. Moving up again on the 26th, the tail end of the British Army, moving towards what was the Jamaica Pass. Here we see where the army under Clinton on the morning of the attack uh, spent the night. Uh, they were looking to come through the Jamaica Pass, which was, of course, very steep, and they were very concerned about being ambushed by the Americans. Now, at this point, I'm just going to jump to the original draft plan, A9459, because as we said before, Debar um, included a lot more detail on that than he did on these two later editions of the plans. Now here, Debar actually shows a detail which is, again, really not seen anywhere else. There's the Jamaica Pass, and this is part of a footpath which went up through the woods above the pass and around the back, where the British sent troops overnight on the 26th to see how bad the opposition was going to be, how many Americans. And we can see that a little bit further if I just highlight on this. There's the line of the pass. And here, in fact, Debar is even marked on the draft plan what appear to be light infantry groups um, skirmishing through the woods and looking. In fact, they came across, I believe, five Americans um, who fell in with them, thinking they were part of the American army, and were then captured um, without firing a shot. Anyway, <laughs> that's part of the story which we're not going to cover tonight. But that detail is not, unfortunately, included on either the um, L690 plans. They are, in fact, oops, apologies, they just leave it blank as such. Anyway, moving on to the Jamaica Road. Here we are on the UKHO edition, and we've got Cornwallis. Or do I mean Clinton? I'm sorry, I mean Clinton, the vanguard of the army, and we have artillery pieces, we've got caissons, we've got all sorts of things coming through here, including light horse, which are um, in fact shown here with annotations coming out to meet the Americans in one of the first engagements um, of the campaign as the Americans were coming back up to the road to try and intercept. That detail, of course, when we look at the um, second edition L690, is not included, or the light horse is shown here, there are no annotation lines. There's no artillery either. And indeed, the road has been erased from the uh, engraved plan. Moving across swiftly, this is the main field of action just south of Brooklyn and through the hills and here we see the effects of Grant's um, push on the 26th up the left side to meet the Americans and on the second feint we have the uh, Hessians marked K here coming up the hill putting pressure on the Americans forcing them back up the hill to be met by yet more British who have arrived, as we can see on the UKHO edition. They arrived later in the day on the 27th. They got as far as the, um, uh, the American lines, and then they retreated on Howe's um, command because he felt they were vulnerable. And as they came back, they walked straight in, or they came straight into the Americans who were then trapped. That was the major field of action on the 27th. If we come up to Brooklyn itself, again we've got, um, in green, we've got defences which were engraved on both of the plans, again with the military or the troop positions added by hand. Anything in yellow 
was not engraved on both plans. It was, in fact, added later on. And in that respect, the two L690s differ with the information there. Fort Sterling here, by the way, was um, laid out by the Americans, but it wasn't actually finished by the Americans. That was done by the British after they had moved the uh, Americans out of Brooklyn. So, moving quickly north, uh, we come on the 15th September to an area we've looked at before. We've got uh, the British ships covering the landing at uh, Kepps Bay, as Debar describes it. It's Kipps Bay, I think, now. Nowadays, that's the Orpheus, the Carisfort, the Phoenix, the Rose, and uh, the other one. Anyway, uh, all the troops and transports, they all are all engraved, as we've seen before. And we even have troops, uh, transports down here at Bushwick and Inlet, all engraved on the plan. And let's come back out and let's slide up here and we get to Fort Washington. Fort Washington, again, all of the information here the, is engraved, that is the um, in, entrenchments are engraved, the battlements and the troop positions added by hand. Just here I would say that we have a little debate going on as to whether these are American or they're British troops. They were American positions and this clearly shows Hessians and British here. Um, whether it's the colorist actually put in here uh, British colors as opposed to American colors behind the um, entrenchments is for debate, but for the moment we'll assume that they are in fact American, sorry, British positions. At the time this was produced, uh, here we have Fort Washington with Hessians above it, and we've got Lieutenant, sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Sterling, no, it is Lieutenant <laughs> Colonel Sterling and Brigadier Leslie helping to support the attack on Fort Washington. Now, as we move further north, we have a line of encampments which are shown after the 16th of November and Dobbs Ferry on the plan, but there's very little else shown on the plans here, which is really of any note. Uh, actually, coming back here to the 12th and 18th of October, we've got Frog's Point or Throg's Point or Throg's Neck, whichever it's called. Um, again, this was a massively important area for the British, uh, which nearly um, went horribly wrong. But Debar has not included very much information here at all, other than to show American defences. And the only other effective defences that we see on the plans here are, again, just moving across after White Plains uh, and after Fort Washington was taken, Cornwallis came across on the 18th or on the 18th arrived at Fort Constitution, Fort Lee, where he sacked the fort and chased the Americans out down through um, New Jersey towards Pennsylvania. And we have a Chevaux de Frise shown on this. So there we have the military information included on the two L690 plans. The big story here is that in fact the Information is very detailed down in the early um, months of the campaign, but as the campaign went north, and clearly um, detailed military information for Debar dried up. Uh, there's less to be seen at the top end. It's still, however, a remarkable piece of detail included on the plans. Now, just before we leave this look at the military information included on the L690s, I'd just like to go back quickly. Uh, we know that Debar included more information on his draft plan than he did on the subsequent L690s in certain places. Um, and here are two examples of this, one of which at Newtown and Flushing, we've already had a quick look. Um, here we see troop positions on that plan. If we go to the First edition L690, we can see that those spaces have been left empty because Debar clearly felt the information was irrelevant. There's only one part 
here, and that is the artillery position, which was engraved um, onto those plans, likely by accident. And when we look at the LOC edition, the second edition of the L690, we see the same thing. Looking across at the um, area of Harlem Plains, just above Manhattan, we have got, uh, again, lots of troops and lots of information um, marked on the draft plan. When we look at the UKHO edition, they have all gone apart from the artillery positions, which remain the same, more or less. And by the time we get to the second edition of the L690, again, those positions are left empty. This is clearly because Debar felt that as events were moving on, he didn't want to cloud his map with more information than was actually um, pertinent to what was happening at the time. While we have yet to find any one source of the military information Debar received, especially early on in the campaign, we may consider the following. The level of knowledge about the detail of events and troop organisation would match that of a commander in the field, or just as likely an aide-de-camp such as Major Camellius Kyler, aide-de-camp to Howe, who brought Howe's second report of the 3rd September back to London in person in October of 1776. There was also Captain Archibald Robertson, who was a talented artist and engineer who was on house staff and well known to friends of Debar out in New York at the time. Other people who appear to have detailed knowledge of such events include Lord Francis Rawdon, aide-de-camp to General Clinton, who himself produced the following plan. The plan itself is a good example of the type of field recording which was being made by other officers and engineers at the time. Unfortunately, Rawdon is unlikely to prove to be the source. Then, of course, the bar would have had the same access to the official reports which were coming back from America at the same time as William Faden and other prominent mapmakers. It is, of course, worth remembering that any one amongst Debar's political and social acquaintances may well have had access to current detailed information as well. Finally, we also know that Debar had good relations with a number of senior naval officers, such as Captain Hyde Parker, whom we know supplied at least one copy of Lieutenant Hunter's plan of the North or Hudson River in 1776. That Debar's information was of the highest quality is not in question. Across both L690 editions, the military disposition is labelled with letters, even though no key to the letters is provided. Here at the lowlands of Long Island, by Gravesend and New Utrecht, we see units labelled C. On the Jamaica Road, British Army units are labelled A and below that F. On the North or Hudson River, Fort's military units and a chevaux de frise are labelled Z or Z if you're my American family, P, V, U and W, oh, and T. Having spent some time pondering as to where Debar's references to the L690 plans could possibly be, a close look at Debar's own plan of the operations, seen here on the left, and a rough sketch or draft plan of the Hudson River, likely made by Lieutenant John Hunter of the Royal Navy, UKHO A339, revealed the answer. Here we see events of the campaign listed and labelled, albeit in a different order with different letters on both plans. And here we see a comparative listing of those references. All remaining references not included 
on the two plans may be found on the extra reference sheet for Debar's plan of the operations, which was sometimes included in the Atlantic Neptune. This sheet includes detail of British and Hessian units, including brigade and battalion commanders. And here is the first page of a summary sheet of the references across all plans. The full listing may be found in the appendix to the paper Debar's Great Folly in the research locker of the Heritage Charts website. With regard to references, we might take a moment to look at the soundings recorded on the two L690 plans. All soundings circled in red here are copied directly from the draft plan A9459. And the soundings circled in blue come directly from UKHO A339, Lieutenant John Hunter's plan. The bar's first reason for change was, of course, war. Here we see the area covered by the British General Survey from Canada south. It was started by the British because they needed better information as to their land holdings in North America after the end of the French Indian War in 1764. The survey was led by Captain Samuel Holland. As the war gained momentum, starting in New England in July 1775, so too the General Survey was just turning the corner to arrive in Connecticut, Long Island and New York, where it had already become too difficult for the survey teams to continue their work safely, and it was increasingly difficult for the Royal Navy to support the hydrographic element of the survey. These surveys had been the sources of material for Debar and the Atlantic Neptune up until this time. After Boston, while George Washington went down to New York in anticipation of the next phase of the war, the British hightailed it to their base at Halifax to regroup before amassing their forces and targeting New York. By April 1776, New York was, for Debar, the answer to his problem that new survey material to work with was going to dry up, and an account of the campaign would provide a way for him to promote himself further. Debar's second reason for change was that there was a new developing audience emerging to whom he could appeal. From the moment unrest in New England had erupted, the demand for accurate and up-to-date information as to developments in the conflict was increasing. Here we see an early example of propaganda, the cartoon from the time depicting Lord North, the British Prime Minister, declaring the rebellion would soon be crushed, while Lady America sits despondently at his feet, surrounded by some fairly irate American taxpayers, as if there's any other kind. Anyway, by March 1776, with expectation high that New York would be the next theatre of action, public interest accelerated further, with magazines and newspapers back in London clamouring for information. Debar's third reason for a change in direction was, as was always the case with him, money. He was constantly claiming that the Board of the Admiralty was not meeting his expenses, and he wrote endless memorials for payment. In fact, the arrangement he had with the Board of the Admiralty for the production of the Atlantic Neptune was unique, and in hindsight quite favourable, but in 1782 the Admiralty finally acquiesced to most of his claims. By 1775, he had already established personal links with a number of significant military figures, including Lord Viscount William Howe, along with an assortment of admirals and senior captains in the Royal Navy. Also, political and social figures back in Britain, including the Dukes of Cumberland, that's the brother of the King, and York, second son of George III, 
Lord George Germain, the first Viscount Sackville, James Lutterall, William Littleton, Lord Westcote, that is, uh, John Campbell, the fifth Duke of Argyll, and so the list goes on. Patronage was clearly at the heart of his strategy for favour and funding for the continuation of his beloved Atlantic Neptune project, and, of course, his own standing as a major map and chart publisher. Of course, there was no bigger or more important patron than that of the king himself, George III. So, for Debar, there was only one question, how to get the attention of the king, with expectation high back in England that the coming campaign in New York would see an end to the conflict, Debar made the decision to produce the ultimate statement plan of the British offensive and, of course, the expected victory. Not, however, the type of broadsheet which was the preserve of publishers such as William Faden, geographer to the king. Instead, something on a grand scale. A definitive statement plan worthy of the king, or, at the very least, a small number of well-connected, significant public and social and military figures capable of significant financial support and patronage. Now, before we leave the question of patronage, it has been suggested that the two plans we see today were intended for the two Howe brothers, General William Howe and Vice Admiral Richard Howe. My question to you is, which one would you give the first edition of the plan to, and who would get the second? If there was ever to be more than one plan, it would certainly be a lot of work to keep adding military detail to each one by hand, and further engraving was unlikely to happen. That there are no specific financial statements relating directly to the two L690 plans that have been uncovered so far is perhaps understandable, if Debar strapped the project before presenting it. After all, it's unlikely that he would want to admit to such a failure. However, we may still get an idea of the costs of production if we take a look at Debar's financial statement relating to the Atlantic Neptune. Oh, and by the way, when we look at these figures, you might try to remember that there are 20 shillings to a pound and 21 shillings to a guinea in 1776. And indeed, when I was born. Anyway, moving on. One guinea in 1776 is equal to about $207 in 2023. 35 guineas in 1776 is equivalent to about $7,247 in 2023. Anyway, I digress. There are in fact two figures at play here. Within the allowance Debar was afforded was a contingency amount which was to cover the expense for the salary, housing, feeding, etc. of those in his employ. Also, the cost of maintaining up to three workshops. Over the 10 years the allowance was in place, Debar produced 257 plates for the Atlantic Neptune. If we take the contingency figure of 5,475 and divide it by 257, we get a figure of £21 per plate in 1776 for the making of the individual sheets about $4,141 in 2023. This would give us a figure of £126.1776 for Debar to produce one copy of the L690, which is about $16,960 in 2023. Of course, that also required printing, which was another £7 per sheet in 1776. This would give us an overall cost for just one edition of the plan in 2023's money of a mere $18,340. Of course, if more copies were made, the cost comes down exponentially, such that two copies in 2023 would only be $9,170 each to produce, and so on. Remember that these figures are simple projections based on the notion that Debar 
already had about 20 people on his payroll at the time and that he was already paying for their skills as well as their overall costs. He likely produced the L690 plans at cost and hid or absorbed the actual expense when he was unable to produce the final product. Even then, he would have had expenses and the whole enterprise cannot have been without financial loss. Now, all of this brings us to the ultimate failure and redundancy of Debar's attempt to produce a statement plan of the campaign, his great folly. Here we see the area of White Plains where, on the 28th of October, General Washington and his army were engaged by the British. It was a pivotal encounter in the campaign of 1776 and provided General Howe with a much needed victory. And it wasn't in the scope of Debar's statement plan. Now, in fairness to JFW, it wasn't his fault that in October 1776, General Washington made the decision to hightail it up to White Plains, nor indeed that General Howe would choose to follow him. But at this point, Debar's initial decision to lay out the geographic area for the anticipated British victory was laid bare as being inadequate. Here we have UKHO A339, or the plan of the North or Hudson River likely made by Lieutenant John Hunter in 1776. It was transmitted back to Debar by Captain Hyde Parker, who was a friend of his. When we look closely at this plan, it contains one grievous error. The towns of New Utrecht and Gravesend have been transposed. Now, this is an error which may have been okay for a rough sketch, but when we look at the L690s, we see the same error has been repeated. Now, this is not an error which is acceptable for a map or a chart maker of Debar's reputation, especially if it is on a statement plan worthy of the king. The point at which Debar gave up on the L690 plans must finally have been with Howe's last report of the 30th of November which arrived on the Secretary of State's desk, that was Lord George Germain, on the 30th of December 1776. The report contained news of White Plains, Fort Washington and Cornwallis's capture of Fort Constitution, or Fort Lee as it was also known, between October and the end of November. Although it is quite likely that even before the official report arrived, Debar had already started work on engraving a single plate for production of a small-scale map of New York on which he could include all of the military detail and information he had already amassed. The resulting sketch of the operation of His Majesty's fleet and army in New York, under the command of Vice Admiral the Right Honourable Lord Viscount Howe and General Sir William Howe KB, in 1776, is generally regarded as one of the best contemporary depictions of the campaign ever made. It represents something of a recovery for Debar, inasmuch as he was able to print and publish the plan in the January of 1777, about the same time as other publishers produced similar plans. In order to draw conclusions on Debar's attempt to make a statement plan, we should note the following. Firstly, the military information included on the plan is exceptional, especially early on in the campaign around the landing and the action at Brooklyn, Long Island, even though it gets sketchier as the campaign went north. Although we do not as yet know for certain who his sources of military information were, the plans show us that Debar was very well connected. The fact that he replicated the mistake Lieutenant Hunter made in transposing Gravesend and New Utrecht highlights the perils of making maps and plans remotely, that is, reliant on the information of others. When looking at the likely costs involved, we have an indication as to the character and tenacity of Debar. He was prepared to take risks. That he started laying out the scope of his plan as early as April or May 1776 
shows that he was proactive and forward-thinking. The construction of the plans, such that he could have extended the geographic area, had he so chosen to do, or indeed, more likely, was able to afford to do, is masterful, if somewhat unmanageable. That he ultimately still managed to utilise the military information he had amassed into a small-scale, single-sheet plan of the campaign shows that he was not one to give up easily. Overall, we must conclude that his attempt to produce the ultimate statement plan of the campaign in New York in 1776 was a failure. It was truly a great and expensive folly, which fell foul of the same arrogance that befell the British, like so many after them, who assumed that a conflict would be contained and decided in the anticipated place. By way of an end note, I would like to show you this. Here we see Ratzer's plan of the City of New York. It's a second edition, printed 1776. And specifically, the uppermost section of the plan, along with the centre panel of UKHO A9459. Now, at the time I first encountered A9459, I was especially struck by the fact that it had stuck in the middle of it a plan of the lower part of New York Island, or Manhattan, which I then, and still now, believe to be Bernard Ratzer's finished copy drawing for the Ratzer Plan of New York. The Ratzer Plan was sent to Faden and Jeffries for printing in 1770, and de Barr would most certainly have had access to it. And, no doubt, delighted in utilising it as a starting point for his new project.